For many, Christmas is a time for family, love, religion and fun. It's steeped in tradition, merriment, the giving of gifts and indulgence. The telling of ghost stories during winter is one such tradition that seems to be fading away. But today, I bring you a selection of ghost stories with a Christmas theme. From a ghostly man on horseback in Cheshire to a murder in London. From a haunted royal residence to an ancient manor house in Kent. Welcome to the Christmas special. Built in 1290 as a dwelling for a knight in the reign of Edward I, Old Saw Manor is an important example of 13th century domestic architecture. The property was built for the powerful Culpepper family, the largest landowners in Kent and Sussex. Rumours circulate that the family used to kidnap wealthy heiresses and force them to marry the Culpepper sons to keep the dynasty thriving. The manor is reputedly haunted by two different ghosts. The centre of the house originally would have been the Great Hall, but this was demolished in 1780 after a fire, and a red brick farmhouse now stands on its site. Visitors to this Grade 2 listed building can visit the family's private living and sleeping area, known as a solar, and the chapel, and this is where our resident ghosts seem to dwell. After the Culpeppers, the property passed to the Geary family, who lived here in the 18th century. They employed a 17-year-old dairymaid and domestic help named Jenny, who was hard-working, though quiet and shy. She was regarded by locals, perhaps unfairly, as a simpleton, and she was naive to the ways of the world. She had fallen in love with a fellow farm worker named Ted, who was 10 years older than her, but not interested in a serious relationship. On Christmas Eve, 1775, Jenny was in the kitchen, preparing food for the lavish Geary family Christmas dinner. The wealthy landowners had hired musicians, and the dancing, drinking and partying were in full swing. The family's priest, almost senseless from the consumption of ale, discovered Jenny alone in the kitchen. A rather startled Jenny, hard at work, rejected the priest's inappropriate and very forward advances. The priest became angry. Frustrated and humiliated by Jenny's response, he grabbed the poor girl by the arm, dragged her against her will to the barn where he seduced her. Jenny was too afraid to protest, as he was one of the gentry, and who would believe the word of a servant girl over a man of the cloth? A number of weeks later, Jenny discovered she was with child, but out of fear and shame, she didn't tell a soul. It was only as the pregnancy became visible in the summer months that questions began to be asked. Her enraged father demanded to know who was responsible. Jenny refused to reveal the identity and was subsequently ordered to leave the family home. Looking for help, she went to Ted, who rejected Jenny, exclaiming that it was her own fault for allowing herself to be seduced. She felt unable to go to the master, who would likely dismiss her. There was only one option left, to confront the priest himself and beg for mercy. The following Sunday, she found the priest playing the organ in the chapel after holding a service. He quickly realised the reason for the visit. She pleaded for help, but the priest was resolute. He wanted nothing to do with her, refused to admit responsibility, and ordered her to leave the chapel and not to return. There are two versions of how the story concludes. 
feeling weak and faint from the priest's harsh words, the pregnancy itself, and the searing heat of a summer's day, Jenny went to the nearby basin, filled with water. She began to scoop up the water to drink, but she fainted and hit her head and drowned in two inches of holy water. The second version is far more sinister. The priest, fearful of being involved in a scandal and being expelled from the church, willfully pushed Jenny's head into the water to ensure her life ended. The Geary family, unaware of Jenny's exact circumstances, assumed this was a suicide and she was buried at midnight in unconsecrated ground. For decades, Jenny's sad story was forgotten until the 1970s, nearly 200 years after her death, when the restless apparition of Jenny began to return to the manor. The chapel we see today was being used to store valuable hay and straw. In 1971, an elderly farm labourer was employed to protect the goods when he heard the distinct sounds of a woman's footsteps pacing back and forth over the floor. He had no idea this was the original chapel where Jenny took her last breath. Mysterious lights would appear in the building and then suddenly disappear. Organ music emanated from the empty chapel and extreme temperature drops were noted by a number of visitors. In 1972, several guests reported seeing a shadowy figure of a man wearing robes bent over the spot where the basin is located. Could the priest be reliving the moment he murdered poor Jenny? Residents in the red brick farmhouse, built on the foundations of the Great Hall, and unaware of the property's dark past, also inquired separately about the church music they could hear coming from the empty building. In 1973, a female custodian was puzzled to see a long grey cloak mysteriously hanging on the wall of the chapel. She knew this was not on display ordinarily, and she watched in astonishment as the cloak slowly faded away. Other paranormal incidents include the sounds of water splashing, the sobbing cries of a female, the feeling of an unhappy atmosphere that can bring visitors to tears, and the sense of a presence standing directly behind you. Does the restless soul of Jenny return to the chapel where her life was so sadly cut short? Was she indeed murdered at the hands of a priest? Does she wish for her remains to be given a Christian burial, even though nobody knows for certain where they are? And is it ironic that she returns to the aptly named Old Saw Manor, with the word saw meaning grief in Norman French? What do you think? Bramall Hall is a beautiful black and white half-timbered manor house located in Greater Manchester. Largely Tudor in age, its oldest parts date back to the 1300s and the property was extended significantly in the 16th and 19th centuries. Today the hall is open to the public as a museum and this Grade 1 listed building is surrounded by 64 acres of magnificent parkland. A number of powerful families have lived and died here over the centuries, and perhaps this is why Bramall Hall is said to be haunted by at least four ghosts. The manor was held by the Davenport family for over 500 years. The first William Davenport played a significant role in the final battle of the Wars of the Roses at Bosworth. He was instrumental in gaining the crown for Henry VII, who rewarded him financially. In 1585, the fifth William Davenport inherited Bramall from his father of the same name, and he lived there with his wife Dorothy for over 50 years. Our first and most famous ghost story from the hall takes us back to a terribly stormy New Year's Eve in the 1630s. William Davenport watched the mysterious figure of a man wearing a flowing red cape 
galloping through the courtyard, seeking shelter from the atrocious storm. William Davenport, a kind and trustworthy man, invited the stranger in and secured the property from the biting wind. He was welcomed inside, rested, given food and drink, and entertained beside a roaring fire. Davenport offered the man a room for the night, and the weary traveller gratefully accepted his host's kind offer. The following morning, William Davenport was discovered dead, lying on the floor of the medieval Great Hall, and the unknown man in red had disappeared. Although the man vanished from the scene of the crime, people living near to the hall are convinced that to this day, on New Year's Eve, the unmistakable figure of a phantom, his red cloak blowing in the breeze, still gallops towards the hall on his trusty dark horse. As soon as he begins to approach the hall, he simply vanishes into thin air. Another ghost, immortalised in a local folk song for centuries, is Alice, often named the Maid of Bramall Hall. Legend says Alice was eagerly awaiting the love of her life to return. He was due to come home from fighting in the Napoleonic Wars in Europe. She went about her chores, but her heart leapt in her chest when she heard a galloping horse heading through the courtyard. She rushed downstairs and eagerly threw open the door, but her hopes came to a bitter end when only the horse could be seen. Her lover was missing. A local gamekeeper approached the hall and delivered the devastating news. Her lover's battered and lifeless body had been discovered in nearby woods in Macclesfield. He'd been ambushed by a gang of cutthroat highwaymen who attacked him, robbed him and left him for dead. Distraught by this revelation, Alice locked herself up in a room where she eventually starved and died from a broken heart. Visitors to the hall have reported witnessing the grief-stricken apparition of Alice moving through the house. She grieves the loss of her love and it seems that she's tethered to a location where such emotional trauma took place. Her cries of anguish, it is said, can be heard echoing throughout the otherwise silent house in the dead of night. A second female figure, said to roam the house, is thought to be that of Dorothy, the wife of William, who was killed by the Red Rider. It seems she has made the first floor her home, and she's been witnessed by members of staff and visitors many times. In 1997, a guest was looking around Neville's room by herself, when she began to feel rather uneasy. Sensing something was not right, she left the oppressive atmosphere of the room and headed towards the paradise bedroom, but the feelings only became worse. Moments later, a hazy female apparition began to manifest. It glided across the room, but appeared to have no feet whatsoever. The visitor watched in astonishment as the spectre vanished into the wall of the neighbouring room. Acting quickly, the lady followed and headed towards the withdrawing room next door, where the footless apparition continued to glide across the floor. Overwhelmed by this experience, she darted down the stairs where the guides met the distressed visitor. The guides were not surprised to hear the visitor's story and confirmed that the house is definitely haunted. Indeed, they explained that a new floor had been installed in the withdrawing room and this may explain the apparition's lack of feet. Other strange goings-on in the withdrawing room include service dogs refusing to enter, sudden drops in temperature, and the sound of rustling skirts along the floor. Some have heard a female's voice quietly whisper hello and felt a gentle hand on their shoulder. Perhaps a more disturbing event occurred in the early 2000s when a carpenter was installing a display case on the wall. As he stood on the top step of his ladder, a jar of nails was snatched from his hand and strewn across the floor of the room. Perhaps Dorothy is not a fan of modern renovations. The grounds of the hall are said to be haunted by the ghost of a little girl who appears to other children, but rarely to adults. She's described as well-dressed, her dark hair neatly tied in ringlets, and she wears a smart blue velvet coat. She peeps out from behind trees, beckons children to play, and occasionally is heard giggling quietly. 
there are two stories linked to this mysterious little girl, whose nickname is Mary. Some people believe she was walking her puppy in the grounds one winter's day, many centuries ago. The puppy gave chase to a rabbit and ran away, leaving the girl upset and concerned. She desperately searched the woods for her beloved puppy, but to no avail. It became dark, the snow set in, but she still continued her desperate plight to find her little dog. That night, she perished in the woods. Another version of the story is that the young girl was walking through the woods when she encountered a small group of fairies at the base of a tree. Intrigued by the appearance of these enchanting beings, she heard the sound of beautiful music. One of the fairies opened the door to their tree root realm, and the girl saw fairy folk dancing, a lavish banquet of food, and beautiful flickering candles. What happened next is unknown, but the girl was never seen again. In March 1940, a tragic event occurred in the grounds of the hall. 13-year-old local girl, Shirley May Housen, was visiting the grounds with her friend, Maisie Green. Heavy snow had fallen, and a toboggan run had been established in the park. Maisie refused to go on the sledge, stating she thought it was too dangerous. Shirley replied, Oh, it's all right, I was on yesterday. Shirley headed up the hill and got on her toboggan chest down and head first, but her toboggan veered off the designated course. She tried to steer the toboggan with her feet, but it quickly appeared to be out of control. Shirley crashed head first into a wooden bench instead of finishing on the frozen lake. She was admitted to Stockport Infirmary, where she was treated for a fractured skull and sight loss in her right eye. She developed pneumonia and meningitis, from which she sadly died. Dorchester is the county town of Dorset and is located between the coastal town of Poole and the market town of Bridport on the south coast of England. It's a place that's steeped in history. It has an Iron Age fort, the Romans settled here, and for many years it was the home of Thomas Hardy, whose novel, The Mayor of Casterbridge, used a fictionalised version of Dorchester as its setting. Despite its extraordinary history, our Christmas ghost story is rather modern and only occurred in the early 2000s. A lady named Mary Windsor was window shopping in this quiet town when she spotted a beautiful mirror in an antiques shop. She was very much taken by the mirror, but fearing its hefty price tag, she continued her way along the high street. After some gentle persuasion by her friends and convinced it would be a centrepiece in her lounge, Mary purchased the mirror and was excited by this new addition to her home. As the assistant carefully wrapped it, she told Mary, that the mirror had come from a property in London that had once been owned by a wealthy businessman. Mary took the mirror home and positioned it directly above her fireplace. She began to use the mirror daily, checking her appearance before work and using it when styling her hair. She was so pleased with her investment. In December, just a month after the purchase of the mirror, Mary was brushing her hair. It was coming up to 11pm and she was preparing to retire to bed when she saw a black shape swiftly move behind her in the mirror. It startled Mary and she jumped with fright. She turned around and was convinced she had an intruder. But there was no one to be seen. She checked the locks and inspected the other rooms in her home. There was nothing out of the ordinary. Feeling a bit anxious, she made her way to bed but the following morning she gave little thought of the incident of the previous night. That evening, Mary was preparing for a Christmas party. She applied her makeup in the lounge, and as she looked in the mirror, Mary's facial expression began to change. Standing directly behind her, she saw a gentleman looking sad and with his hand on his head as though in great pain. His face was covered in blood. She turned in astonishment, but there was no one there. As she looked back into the mirror again, a different man stared back at her, evil looking and with dark eyes. Again, she believed she must have an intruder, someone had to be in her home. 
she sat down on her sofa and began to shake. Mary attended the party, but she refused to return to her home. She told her friends what had happened, but they couldn't think of a rational explanation. Mary decided to return to the shop where the same sales assistant was working that day. Feeling rather embarrassed, Mary recounted her strange experiences with the mirror. The sales assistant's response made Mary freeze on the spot. Whilst she didn't know a great deal about the mirror's past, she did know it had been sold as the owner had been killed in a robbery that had gone wrong. The thief had been disturbed and the owner was struck on the head with a heavy blunt instrument and died not long after. The sales assistant apologised for not relaying the story at the time of purchase, but items from house clearances are common in the antiques business. Who did Mary see in the mirror? Could it be the victim and his murderer? Crestfallen and saddened by the news, Mary went home and took the mirror down. She felt uncomfortable being in its presence and she sold it not long after. Some people believe that mirrors are portals, others feel they can record energies. Parapsychologist Evelyn Hollow, when talking about a poltergeist incident, explains. In the paranormal world, mirrors are seen as gateways. When someone dies, often people will cover all the mirrors so their soul or spirit won't get trapped inside the property. In lots of belief systems, mirrors are regarded as coveted objects, so you have to be careful with them because sometimes they can allow something else to look through. With poltergeist cases, we have to ask, is it something else trying to get through or something trying to get back? Although this isn't a poltergeist case as such, it begs the question, could the appearance of the apparition have escalated into something far more sinister, a malevolent poltergeist perhaps, that would terrorise Mary in her own home? Located in the city of Westminster, Buckingham Palace has served as the British Sovereign's official London residence and administrative headquarters since 1837. Queen Victoria was the first monarch to reside here. Originally known as Buckingham House, the building at the core of the palace we see today was a large townhouse built for the Duke of Buckingham in 1703. The house was bought by King George III for his wife Queen Charlotte in the 1760s and was substantially rebuilt. Rumours circulate that the palace is not just home to the monarch, but it's also home to resident ghosts. Legend tells of an older building that once stood here, an ancient monastic priory that vanished after the dissolution of the monasteries in the mid-16th century, and of a monk whose ghostly apparition returns to Buckingham Palace to this day. The story suggests that a monk was incarcerated in the Priory's punishment cell for some sort of sinful transgression. He died on Christmas Day many centuries ago. His apparition is said to wear a brown habit, is bound in chains and clanks miserably as he moves. He manifests briefly every year on Christmas Day and he walks along the terrace, moaning as he overlooks the palace's 40 acres of gardens. This story may be true. Early medieval religious orders were not terribly lenient towards offending members and punishments were frequently harsh. Pleas for mercy may well have fallen on deaf ears. The original monastery records might substantiate this story but it is likely that they were destroyed during the time of the dissolution. The Museum of London's records show that the nearest religious establishment was the leper hospital of St James that stood on the site of the present-day St James's Palace. Could the story therefore originate from the hospital as its buildings and lands were monastic property many years ago? The male and female patients were cared for by monks and nuns respectively. 
Other ghost stories connected to the palace include staff feeling that they are being watched and even followed. A palace of this age, with 775 rooms, and with so many employees, has certainly seen its fair share of tragedy. On Tuesday, the 23rd of September 1913, a plumbing company were replacing a lead pipe in the palace as part of routine maintenance. As employees moved a lead pipe weighing between four or five hundred pounds from a van, one of them slipped, a 41-year-old man named Charles Clark, and the lead pipe fell on him, fracturing his skull. He was killed by the blow. And just three weeks later, on Tuesday the 14th of October, another workman died at the palace. Maurice Woodhouse, a painter and decorator, fell from his scaffolding and was killed, leaving a son and a daughter. He was only 43. But the most significant loss of life occurred at the gates of the palace in 1933. A crowd had gathered to watch the changing of the guard, when a car, coming down the hill from Hyde Park Corner, lost control, hit a street lamp and skidded into the dense crowd. Four people were killed, including three RAF men from 12B Squadron in Andover, who were travelling in the vehicle, and a 62-year-old spectator named Mr Richard Rowe. With such an intriguing history, and with the sheer number of people who've lived and worked there, it's not surprising that Buckingham Palace is reputedly haunted. The question is, do the staff and residents experience any ghostly events to this day? And will the Phantom Monk make his annual Christmas Day appearance? I really hope that you enjoyed these Christmas ghost stories. I will admit that I cheated a bit with the Bramwell Hall story as it was really a New Year's story, but I wanted to include it today. And this postscript is going to be a bit of an extended version, so you might want to get yourself a cup of tea or a piece of Christmas cake or something from your selection box. I've got a cup of Twining's English breakfast tea, so I am all set. I have a number of bits and pieces that I'd like to share with you today and I've got a really interesting postcard and a very special item that dates back to 1966. But before I cover those things, I would like to just go back to that story of the mirror in Dorchester. I found that story quite creepy and I thought I'd share with you a story that happened to me when I was about 10 years old. One of my friends lived in a really large, old, detached house in Cardiff, and it was full of grand mirrors, paintings, antique furniture. And it really was an impressive house. In fact, this is the street that she lived on. It had a proper music room with a great big grand piano and a huge Welsh harp. And it also had a formal dining room that seated about 12 people and a really big oak staircase. And their garden was so big that they had vine trees growing and they would make wine. So they had all these large canvases with family portraits and paintings from generations before. So it was a bit special and quite different, I suppose, for the suburbs of Cardiff. I was at my friend's house one night for a sleepover and I think there were four of us. And just before we went to sleep, my friend's mum came into the bedroom with pillowcases and bed sheets and she started covering up all the mirrors in the room and on the landing. And it was so strange, it was just like a parent would tuck a child into bed. It seemed ever so routine. And I remember thinking to myself, what is she doing? What is going on? And I said to my friend, what is your mum doing? And she said to me, because I thought this was all a bit, a bit weird. And she said to me, my mum covers all the mirrors these days because we keep seeing my gran in them at night. And I thought, what? Are you sure? Oh yes, she said, and she was completely matter-of-fact about this. She said, we've all seen her. My mum, my dad, my younger sister. And it was so odd because the entire family was absolutely convinced that Gran, who had died two years ago, was making these nocturnal appearances through the mirrors. I had met Gran several times growing up. She was the epitome of an elderly Welsh lady. She was a fluent Welsh speaker 
and she had really long grey hair that she wore in a really long plait down her back. And she was an amazing singer, piano player. She could play the flute, she could play the harp, and she taught my friend and her sister how to play as well. And I didn't know this at the time, but she had actually died in my friend's house. She didn't live there, but she died in the music room a couple of years earlier. Whenever I think of mirrors and ghost stories, I often think back to that night at my friend's house. And it's a bit of a strange story, really. What do you think about things like that? Do you think people can see people in mirrors? Do you think people can come come back? I wonder. Going back to the story of Mary Windsor and her mirror in Dorchester, I thought I would try and find out about the robbery itself. It's not stated exactly where the robbery occurred, but I wondered if there was a robbery in a property in London where somebody receives a blow to the head and subsequently dies. And the answer is, there are loads. Lots and lots of incidents of people being burgled, robbed in shops, and just really awful incidents of innocent people being attacked. But there was one story that really, really stood out to me. And I do wonder if this is the story of the origin of that mirror. So I thought I'd share it with you. This incident dates back to Christmas Day, of all days, Christmas Day in 1948. And it took place here in a property named Furscroft, which is on George Street in Marlebone in London. A man named Harry Lewis, who's 21 and a labourer of no fixed abode and is completely broke, he's passing the building when he spots a slightly open window in the basement flat. And so he enters the property that belongs to a man named Harry Saul Michelson, who's aged 50. He lives in the property with his wife, who is a professional concert pianist, and she's on tour in Bournemouth that evening, so she's not there. Harry Michelson is a well-known artist and a lightning cartoonist. And I had no idea what that meant, but in effect it was a variety theatre act where the cartoonist would entertain the audience by quickly sketching famous people, maybe political figures, and the audience would be in great anticipation to guess who was being drawn. Harry Lewis enters the property on Christmas Day evening and he goes into the bedroom where Michelson is sleeping He spots a chair with a pair of trousers resting on it. He discovers Michelson's wallet and some coins which he takes. At this point, Michelson wakes up and he sees the intruder and Harry Lewis picks up the tubular steel chair and hits Michelson on the head. Lewis makes his escape and the following morning on Boxing Day, the porter at Furscroft hears a shout for help in the early hours. He finds Michelson outside of his flat, which is number 75, and he's bleeding profusely from his head, and he's clutching a towel to mop the wound. He's rushed to a hospital in Paddington where he undergoes surgery, but he dies the following day. The police investigate and discover fingerprints on the chair. They run a check at Scotland Yard, and they match 21-year-old Harry Lewis, who is known to the police for theft. And Lewis is arrested on the 18th of January, 1849. At his trial at the Old Bailey in February, 1949, Lewis's defence put forth the theory that it was the operation that had killed Michelson, not the assault itself. But the jury were not impressed by this and promptly found Lewis guilty and he was sentenced to death. He was hanged at Pentonville Prison in London on the 21st of April, 1949. A sad story, really, but when I discovered these incidents happened on Christmas Day, it really gave me the chills, and the house was subsequently cleared and sold, so I don't know where Michelson's wife ended up. But could this be the story linked to the mirror in Dorchester? The descriptions do sound quite similar to what Mary Windsor saw, a man bleeding from the head and an evil-looking man. So, I don't know, what do you think? Regarding the story about Buckingham Palace, if you look at any ghost books about London or websites for that matter, you might well find that it says that Buckingham Palace is haunted by the sound of a shotgun going off and that this is allegedly the echo of a man named Major John Gwynne, who was the private secretary to King Edward VII, who ended his life in his office at the palace because he'd become involved in a divorce scandal. 
but I can't find anything on this person. I've found loads of records of Major John Gwynne's from the First World War and Second World War, but I can't find anything about Edward VII having a private secretary called Major John Gwynne. Edward VII's private secretary was called Sir Francis Knowles. He was well established in the palace because he was the private secretary to Edward VII when he was the Prince of Wales. And he also did three years for George V. But I cannot find anything about Major John Gwynne being at the palace. Frankly, I've had enough of this tomfoolery, so I've decided to try and solve the mystery myself by taking matters into my own hands. And you are going to think that I've gone a bit mad, and you might be right. But I have written to Buckingham Palace. But whether you support the royal family or not, I respect your thoughts either way. But to me, it is simply about the ghost stories. I've explained that I have a YouTube channel. I've asked about ghost sightings at the palace. And I've asked about the mysterious Major John Gwynne. And whether or not there was a member of staff with that name. And I've also asked if there are any plans to DNA test the princes in the tower who were resting in Westminster Abbey. Who knows, maybe the royal family will subscribe to my channel. Of course, if I get a reply, I will let you know for sure. I did find documents relating to three suicides at Buckingham Palace, but none of them were gunshot related. Anyhow, let's have a little look at this postcard. It's only a small postcard and it's very short and very sweet. And I think it was posted in the 1920s. And the person's written on it. I do not like this cold weather. Perhaps you do. If you get snow, you will play in it. Aunt Hilda. Now, I've got to be honest, I'm not sure I would mess with Aunt Hilda. She sounds quite scary, actually. Sweet little postcard, though. And it went to Dutton Manor in Lancashire, which I believe is quite a large estate. And the final thing that I wanted to show you is a very special menu from a very haunted place. This is a menu from the Queen Mary, which is located currently in Long Beach. And this was the menu for Boxing Day, when it did its last Christmas cruise, which was in 1966. And it was a cruise around the Canary Islands in Spain. So I thought you might like to have a little look at the things that you can have. I don't think I've ever had a tongue omelette. Not sure I would actually like one either. Turnips, spinach. I've got to be honest, for Boxing Day, that's an awful lot of food. If you've had Christmas Eve on the Queen Mary and Christmas Day and Boxing Day, you're probably going to go home at least a stone heavier. And that's just the lunch menu. There would probably be a dinner menu in the evening as well. I'd have to sleep for a week if I ate any of that. Anyway, if you were feeling energetic, you could go for a spin on the dance floor of the Queen Mary. And maybe you would dance away to the UK's Christmas number one in 1966, which was Green Green Grass of Home by fellow Welshman Tom Jones. And on that note, I'm going to leave you to celebrate Christmas with your family. I'd just like to wish you a very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. I will say it in Welsh for you, which is Nadolla Clawen, ar Blwyddyn Newydd Dda, which means Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. And I would also like to thank you and say Diolch Fawr Iawn, which means thank you very much for all your support, your loyalty, your comments, your subscriptions. This channel has really picked up this year. It's been phenomenal. And... I'd like to say Hoylvaur, which means goodbye. But just before I do, I need to say one more thing. I need to say Penbloid Happis to Rob C2212. Happy birthday, Rob. I know you're 37 today. Have a lovely, lovely birthday. And I'll see you all in the new year. Thanks, everybody.